Steven Anderson exposes himself as a lost man. Um, if you're not convinced by now that he's lost, this video should give you all the proof that you need. Um, what I'm going to show you in this is I'm going to show you proof of how you can spot somebody who is a self-righteous lost sinner. Uh, they, they always do two things that give themselves away, that it's their own righteousness which they count in. I'm going to show you the proof of that here in just a couple minutes. And he openly denies what God's Word says and he changes the Scriptures. He uses a perfect textbook example of Jesuitical sophistry. Jesuitical sophistry is they basically just confuse what they're saying. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about when we get into the study here. Um, and, you know, just to get it out there, because I know some viewers might not understand the, the issue with Steven Anderson, why I've attacked the guy so much, started in 2009, I've been attacking him ever since then. Um, Anderson has connections. That's why he's still on YouTube. Banned in 34 countries at last count, um, by his own admission, too. He brags about it. Um, he's banned in 34 countries because of his YouTube videos, yet he's still on YouTube. And I have known brethren that have said a lot less offensive things, and they've gotten kicked off of YouTube. My channel has been threatened m numerous times, and I'm not anywhere near as, you know, insane as Steven Anderson. Uh, Steven Anderson has had mainstream media attacking him. YouTube leaves him on. Um, the ADL, a lot of other organizations said, please kick him off. He's a hate criminal, whatever else. YouTube leaves him on. means he's either got Masonic connections, Jesuit connections, both, or something else that I don't even know about yet. But the point is, you say, why do you, why do you got to keep doing this? Why do you, be, you have to be so obsessed? Well, two things. Stephen Anderson, the one thing I'm thankful for about Stephen Anderson is he's provided Bible-believing preachers like myself Great material over the years to teach, you know, people that follow this ministry how to spot a heretic. You've done a good job at that, Anderson. You really, you know, are professional at being a heretic. Um, the other reason, of course, is to rebuke Stephen Anderson and let him know, Steve, we're on to you, and we have been for many, many years. You're fake. You're a fraud. You're lost. You're on your way to hell. Okay, we know who you are, and your little following there, your little new IFB cult that, you know, worships you and bows down at the altar of Stephen Anderson and doesn't dare speak against you. Um, we know. And, uh, but in this study, I'm going to show you a couple things. Now, occasionally I just check in on Stephen Anderson. What's this little heretic up to? Because I, I understand the post-trib mindset. They always go, po they, when, when you go post-trib, you get into replacement theology, you start denying the Holocaust, you teach eternal security in every dispensation, you deny dispensationalism. In this study coming up here, not going to play it, um, but 2 Samuel chapter 8 is what Anderson was preaching on a number of weeks ago. And at uh, 4 minutes and 30 seconds to about 5 minutes, he gets into the whole thing of we're Bible-believing Christians. He used to call himself Baptist. Now it's now he's calling himself a Bible believer. I wonder where he learned that from. And I, I actually heard James White recently say that he's a Bible-believing Christian. <laughs> Which is really kind of funny. Uh, he doesn't believe in one Bible on this earth. But he's a Bible believer. He's a Bible believing Christian. Yeah, Jesuit, whatever. But um, uh, you can watch, if you look at the beginning of the video, his sermon, 2 Samuel 8, you'll see between 4 minutes and 30 seconds and 5 minutes, he says, we're Bible believers. And then he says that we haven't been spoiled by dispensational teaching. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just ignore what the Bible says, you know. Um, Again, I've proved that dispensational teaching is correct. But the main thing that we're going to get into here, proof of a lost man. Every self-righteous lost sinner, there's two ways that you can catch them. Okay? The marks, let me just write this out here. Two marks of a self-righteous sinner. They all do it. Every single one I've ever run into in person, online, in church buildings, <coughs> on the street, they always, you can always catch them in these two things. Okay, they will always say, there's two different things that they will say. Okay, number one, I'm a 
good person. Or he's a good person. He's a good man. Okay? And then they'll play the wee wee game. You say, what's that? We are all sinners. Here's how it works. Well, you know, I understand. Well, yeah, you know, the Bible says all of sin. Yeah, sure, we're all sinners. I mean, none of us are, you know, I'm not a saint or anything. But I mean, I've never killed anybody. I'm not that bad of a person. I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mess up a little bit. You know, a little lust, a little bit of drinking, a little bit of cigarettes, a little bit of drugs once. Yeah, come on. We're all sinners. You see? What's the problem here? No personal conviction or contrition. What does contrition mean? It means you're sorry, not only for what you've done, but for what you are, for who you are. You're sorry. You look, you look to God and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Nope, they don't need to do that. I mean, none of us are saints. None of us are perfect. Hey, you know, I try my best. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. That's how you can spot them, number one. Okay, what about number two? Life is good. Did you ever hear that? Life is good. Life is good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Life is going good for him. I am not being punished. In other words, prosperity. Look at me. Hey, if, God's, if God hates me, if I'm this lost, hellbound sinner, why do I have such a nice house? Why do I have all this money in the bank? My wife can breed like a rabbit. We have all these children. God must be blessing us. God must be for us. You see? I'm actually living a pretty good life. Hey, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Two marks of a self-righteous person. They don't have any personal conviction for their sins. It's called godly sorrow in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. See? They don't have godly sorrow. Maybe the sorrow of the world once in a while. Oh, I got caught doing this or I got, you know, whatever. They'll have that. But there's no personal conviction. I've sinned against God. I deserve to go to hell. I'm so wicked. That's why they preach against repentance, turning from sin and things like that. They, they can't stand that. They'll try to, you, you start to get too rough on sin and these people here will get real offended. You, you're judging me. Who are you to judge me? The whole thing. You know what I mean? And life is good. Hey, if what you're saying is true that I'm this wicked sinner, then where's the punishment of God? Okay? <laughs> I mean, I literally knew a, an old farmer down in West Virginia, and he told a story of an of a old mountain man that he knew, and he said that he was outside, and it was storming the one time, and lightning hit a few feet in front of him, and he said, this guy was so tough, he looked up and he said, you missed me, God. Why don't you get me? And he said, and he lived a long, happy life. Nothing happened to him. Mm -hmm. um, God doesn't always settle accounts in this life. I'm going to show you an example of that in Scripture today. Sometimes the Lord will uh, make it appear that they're getting away with it. Oh, look at how good your life is. You have your little connections and everything else there and whatever else. Because God's got plans for you. God is going to use you to bring about some wicked ends. And then He's going to kill you and damn you to hell for all of eternity and burn you forever and laugh at you. That's what the Bible says. He'll mock when their fear comes. So don't say, oh, God wouldn't do that. You don't understand the God of the Bible if you believe that way. But here's the point. I'm going to show you video proof that this is exactly what Anderson is right here. You see, Stephen Anderson is the victim, another one of the many victims of childhood conversion. They have no conception of sinning against a holy, righteous God. They just get into the wee-wee thing. 
We are all sinners. We all have done wrong. We all need to be saved. We, 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 we. We don't need to be saved. All right? I am saved. Past tense event. If you're lost, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you need to be saved. Not we. Okay? I am saved. You need to be saved. See the difference? Oh, well, we all sin. We all this. We all that. You see, we're trying to relate, you know, so I don't offend you too bad, you know, so I can get your tithe and whatever else. You see how it works? This is the mark of a lost person here. And they say, life is good. Things are going pretty good. Now here, here's, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in this video. Okay. What you need to look out for. Stephen Anderson uses what is called Jesuitical sophistry. Okay. It's something that is crystal clear, plain, right in your face, okay? And Stephen Anderson says, see that? It doesn't mean that. All right? What am I talking about? I'm going to actually show you the verse of Scripture. You can turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 9, verse 13. I'll set it up here for you so you can get it uh, all figured out. Okay? I'm going to write down here, Romans. This is a, one of the most important verses of Scripture that there is. There's a lot of very important Scriptures, but this one's a good one. Romans 9, 13. Look down at the last part of it. It says, quote, Esau have I hated. Now, what Anderson is going to do in this video, in his uh, <clears throat> sermon, little mind control speech that he gives to the, the stupid people down there, they're brainwashed into following him, he says, a lot of people try to apply this to the individual, but it's talking about the people of Esau, not Esau himself personally. Okay, if you can read plain English, Esau have I hated. It's talking about an individual. And it's so funny. What's it say at the beginning there? As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And yet Anderson, if you watch the whole sermon, I'm not recommending to do that, but he goes into this whole rant against Israel. That they're wicked and they're evil and they're not really even true Jews, but the Jews that are in Israel, they're not, they're not true Jews, but the true Jews that are in Israel, they're, they're not really Abraham's seed, but as they think that they're saved because they're Abraham's seed, he, he's a devil. Okay, the spirit of confusion is very mighty in Stephen Anderson. But what he does is, he says, um, <coughs> must have conviction, I'm just looking at that. But what Stephen Anderson does, he says, it's the people, it's not the individual. It's not the individual that Esau have I hated, it doesn't mean Esau. It's the people of Esau. Uh, no, it's Esau. It doesn't say the people of Esau. But then he'll reject the first part where it says, Jacob have I loved. That's the children of Israel, the physical children of Israel. But uh, I'm going to show you here in the, the, this thing. We're going to look at this video. And he says in this thing, he actually says, and you, again, I'm going to show you the proof. Anderson says, it's not Esau that God hates. It's the people. And he says, the, the, the whole thing is there, I believe that Esau is going to be in heaven. I believe he was a saved man. And then the reason he says, he says because Esau was a, he believed and he was a good, a good guy. He will say it in the video. Proof that Anderson is lost. The Bible says there is none good. Okay. But Anderson says Esau believed and he's a good guy. All right, let me show you the proof of that. Grab my computer here. Set this thing up. You have to learn how to spot these people. If you're second Samuel chapter eight, I'm gonna finish shut up. Where I left off in okay. Now, if you want to see the sermon, it's second Samuel eight. Um I don't recommend watching the whole thing because the guy, Anderson, is, is he's one of these guys that you watch and 
he'll make a point and you think, whoa, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. And then he'll just, he'll go on and he'll twist and he'll twist and he'll twist. And in a few minutes, you're left with such confusion. You're thinking, what did he, wait a second, huh? Where, where, and there's a lot of these guys. You listen to them as a Christian, you think, this is just something really wrong here. Mike Hoggard's that way. Stephen Anderson's that way. Uh, a lot of these guys are that way. Uh, Robert Breaker, a lot of these guys. They just say things and you just, huh? This, this is really confusing, okay? But if you're watching this, it's about at uh, 41 minutes we'll start. And he goes into this whole thing about how that Esau's descendants, the Edomites there, that God, you know, did certain things against them and he was against them and whatever else. Yeah, because God hated the foundation of them, their, their, their founder, so to speak, Esau. That's what the Bible says. God hated Esau. But uh, so you can, we're going to skip forward to about 41 minutes here. And then I'm going to play the video for you. Okay, here we go. It's not saying that Esau is going to serve Jacob. That never happened in the Bible. It's saying Edom is going to serve Israel. That happened in 2 Samuel chapter 8. See how that's an important fulfillment there where all Edom, and nobody can say, well, you know, that's not, well, all Edom became David's servants and the Lord preserved David with us wherever he went. So that's an important teaching. Okay. Now, did he say right there? Sure, yeah. Edom, that the prophecy and things that are happening and, and, and whatever else, God gives us specific prophecies about Jacob, Israel, and Esau, Edom. You know, sure, absolutely. But now he'll take that, he'll tell truth, and now he'll twist it and say, see, so when it says, Esau have I hated, then that's talking about the people. I'm going to show you a big problem with that, which Anderson just conveniently fails to mention. Also, if you go to Romans 9 and find that quote, it also says in that same verse, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. They'll try to apply that to the individual. But if you look that one up in Malachi, we won't go there for sake of time. In Malachi chapter 1, it says, I, hate, I hated Esau, I loved Jacob and hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And it says they are the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Now, let's actually turn to Malachi chapter 1. Again, it's okay. You hear some guy saying, you know, hey, you need to, you know, we're not going to do this for sake of time or whatever. But when he's making an emphatic point like this, you need to check him out from the scriptures. If I ever say we're not going to go there for sake of time or whatever else, pause the video and go there. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure any preacher is telling you the truth. But let's check out Malachi. It's the last book in your Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, verse 3, and I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Okay, and so Anderson says, see, now that's the people which we'll see that here in verse 4. But, think about this for a minute. The Lord says, I hated Esau. Esau have I hated, Romans 9, 13. Repeated in the New Testament to a Christian. All right? Yes, God did hate Esau. It does not say the people of Esau have I hated. All right? It's talking about the individual Esau. And I'm going to see, show you that Anderson continues to lie about this. But look at verse 4. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build they, in other words, the people there, but I will throw down and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. All right. So up here in verse 3, or excuse me, verse, yeah, verse 3, I hated Esau and laid his mountains, singular, okay? It's not talking about, uh, you know, well, the people and whatever. It wouldn't say his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. His is referring to Esau. And then it gets into his descendants and, and the, the curse of God that came upon them. There in verse 4. See, that's why he says, don't turn there. Don't bother turning there. See, he deceived his people. Anderson deceived his people. If you read verse 3 there, it's saying, I hated Esau and laid his, Esau's mountains and his heritage. Esau's heritage. 
But see, Anderson's not going to teach you that stuff. But it's interesting. I want to just show you another verse of Scripture here back in Deuteronomy. Let me see where my... I got my notes covered up here. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Another thing that Anderson didn't uh, tell his people about. This is a good one to use on these uh, moronic uh, black Hebrew Israelite guys. Stupid heretics that they are. <laughs> just, guys are just driving me nuts. Um, they'll say, you're an Edomite. You're, you know, if you're white, you're an Edomite. You know, Edomite, Edomite. <laughs> um, and they, they just, they're so rabid against the Edomites. Somehow miss this verse. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. Hmm. Now, if God hates the Edomites, why would he tell the children of Israel, don't abhor an Edomite because he's your brother? It's kind of weird. <laughs> you know, doesn't the Bible condemn hating your brother? Yeah. You just kind of skip right over the, those as Anderson. But let's continue here. <clears throat> I want to play a little bit more of this video. I have to endure through it. I know it's rough. So who's God mad at? The person Esau or the nation of Esau? It was the nation of Esau that he was mad at. It's the nation of Esau that God's mad at. Esau have I hated. His mountains, his heritage. It's talking about Esau. If God was going against the people or the nation of Esau, he would have written it that way. It's talking about an individual. And you're going to see here, Anderson lies about why God hated Esau. Let's continue. And he never laid the person Esau... He never laid his habitation waste for the dragons of the wilderness. He actually prospered Esau. Esau actually prospered and did well in his old age and, and thrived and succeeded. Esau did well. Esau did well. He thrived in his old age. You see? Picks up the cup, gets all arrogant. He did well. He did well. He thrived in his old age. God didn't, God didn't mess with him. Well, then with that line of thinking, then there's a lot of Hollywood actors that died quite successful financially. So I guess maybe they're saved too. But now, now he says he, he's going to say here, i start the video again, he's going to say, I believe he's in heaven. And listen to the reason why. I believe Esau's in heaven. You know, people think, oh, you're crazy, you're nuts. He believed. He was a good guy. There's nothing, you know. He believed. He was a good guy. You see? You see what I'm saying? He believed he was a good guy. God actually prospered him. How could he be in hell? And, and, and by the way, where does it say, where does the Bible say Esau believed? Look it up. It doesn't say anything like that. He believed. He believed. What did he believe? Oh, the gospel, apparently. These, these idiots in the new IFB actually teach. They truly, really teach, ask them if you don't believe me, they really truly believe that the gospel was there of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ before Jesus died and was buried and resurrected. There's typology back in the Old Testament and that was the gospel. And they were believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they were saved by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus before he even died on the cross then why on earth would Jesus Christ come down and die on the cross when it was already, salvation was already there by that method? <laughs> well, he had to fulfill it in the future or something like this. These, these guys are idiots. Okay, they're not, they're, excuse me, they're not idiots. They know what they're doing. They're frauds, they're fakes, they're devils. Okay, um, all you got to do is just read the Gospels. Jesus is saying, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me and, and they're going to bury me and three days later I'll rise again. And the disciples are saying, be it far from thee, Lord. No, no. And they're not understanding. Jesus dies and he's buried. And the, the women see him, you know, come up from the, the, the they go to the grave and, and the angels are there and they're saying, he's not here, he's risen. And they go back and they tell the, the disciples and the disciples are saying, I don't believe you. I have to go see it. Walking down the road and Jesus is walking with them and they say, we thought he was the one that was supposed to come. And Jesus starts to upbraid him and say, don't you believe all the prophets and everything that were written about me? You don't believe but they were saved by believing. 
basically just read the scriptures and you can see that these new IFB guys are just lying to you. Nobody was saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to Jesus dying on the cross. They had no idea about it. Even when Jesus was walking the earth, his own disciples didn't understand it. But let's continue here. And now, now he's going to give you the reasons why Esau was saved. Okay? This is funny. This, he's going to, first he's going to talk about the sins of Esau, and then he'll get into why you know, he got saved. Let's read. Or let's not read. Let's watch. Now, did he make some major sins in his life? Oh, yeah. What were the sins of Esau? He married multiple wives. This is what Esau did wrong. He married multiple wives. He married heathen wives. Okay. Now, um, he married multiple wives. He married heathen wives. Um, why don't we actually turn to the scriptures? Okay. Go in your Bible to Genesis chapter 26. We'll actually show you what's going on there and why Anderson could not tell the truth. Genesis chapter 26. Verse uh, 34 and 35. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bath, Bash, Bashimath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Oh, they, they were just heathen. They were, it's called interracial marriage. It doesn't say anything about them being, quote unquote, heathen. It says about their race, Hittite. Well, couldn't they have been saved Hittites? Wouldn't have mattered. They were Hittites, interracial marriage. But see, Anderson, you look in the little congregation there, and he's got interracial marriage couple here, interracial marriage couple there. He marries them all the time. Doesn't matter whatever they are, black, white, Hispanic, just, you know, do you want to marry that? You just marry this? Okay, yeah, shh, go ahead. <sighs> Covers up the fact. It wasn't just multiple wives and heathen what it was interracial marriage right and then listen to here in a little bit what he says that Esau did and he, and he got right then or whatever again he'll lie here in, in a couple minutes but listen to the other thing here quick let's continue and he hated his brother in his heart and he hated his brother in his heart well uh yes he did and that is wrong and you know certainly to hate his brother Jacob certainly Anderson's right on that one See, again, the Jesuitical way of doing this thing. See, Jesuitical sophistry. It says, Esau have I hated, but it doesn't mean that he hated Esau. You say, wait a second, huh? Those two, contrad you know, the two statements contradict each other. No, they don't. You say that there's a contradiction, but I don't see the contradiction. Huh? <laughs> Esau have I hated, but God didn't hate Esau. Yeah. And then he pulls it off again and he says, you know, um, I'll do the thing he'll say, a total lie. And then he supports it with truth and says, well, see, I told the truth here. So then you have to accept the other one. See? But let's continue. Okay. But let me ask you this. Is there evidence that he later repented of those things and actually did right before the Lord? Yeah. Funny because it was, did he re you know, repent of those things and do right before the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought there, Anderson, you don't have to repent of anything. You just believe. <laughs> Another little issue there, but we won't get into that. But listen to what he says. Is there evidence that he repented of marrying heathen wives? Well, yeah, because, I mean, at le he did say he saw that it upset his parents. So then he, he took a third wife that was not a heathen, and he thought that would fix it. <laughs> well, you know, that didn't fix it. <laughs> I didn't fix it. Okay, okay scamper squirrel. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know... He, he, he saw that it, it, it displeased his wives, and so he, he got a real wife after that. <laughs> okay, well, let's actually look at the scriptures. Okay, Genesis chapter 27, verse 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as, they are, which, such as, as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? 
Okay? And Isaac called Jacob, chapter 28, verse 1, and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Okay? Remember that. Look at, uh, jump down to verse 6. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Paddan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, look what he does. Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. Oh, he, he did right by marrying the right kind of woman. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He still went to the heathen. He still went to Ishmael and said, okay, well, I'm not going to just go total daughter of Heth, you know, whatever. I'm not going to go with a total Canaanite, but I'm going to get one that's blended. Half Jew, half Egyptian. That's what Ishmael was. His mother was, was, you know, Hagar, and his father was, was, you know, Abraham. So he still did not go to the Jews. He still went, he went to Ishmael. Why? Because he saw it displeased his parents. The guy was a total lousy jerk. Right? And by the way, let me just make another point here. You say, um, well, those were the sins of Esau. The sins of Esau married multiple wives, heathen wives, and he hated his brother in his heart. Uh, what about the birthright? Why didn't Anderson mention that one? Look at Genesis chapter 25. Talk about a sin that made the Lord mad. Genesis chapter 25, verse 29 through 34. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came, in, came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. You wonder why God hated Esau? He despised his birthright. Why didn't Anderson mention that? Oh, just kind of left that part out, I guess, you know, whatever, because, hey, he was a good guy. God prospered him. He was a good guy. God prospered him. You see? I think he's in heaven, honestly. I think he's in heaven. Yeah, sure. Mm hmm. So I think that's enough for the Anderson video. I don't want to vex anybody anymore. Um, I'll play a little bit more, I guess, here. See what else he says. But then also, he felt bad about the fact that he hated his brother because he made things right with his brother. Remember when Esau comes and hugs Jacob and he's crying and he's sorry? What about that? And then God blesses him and everything's great after that. <laughs> God blesses him. Everything's great after that. Esau believed he's a good man, and God blessed him. He did quite well financially. Hey, as long as you're doing good, you know, yeah, you might have to yoke up with the Masons a little bit, you know, maybe just got to, you know, have a little pull of strings a little bit behind the scenes there and things, and maybe the Jesuits or whoever else, the whole Hiles Anderson Baptist mind control cult, yeah, maybe you just have to kind of get plugged into that system, and they'll kind of, you know, grace the skids for you so things... Go pretty good there. You can make some good money there, you know, from your church building enterprise that you have where you have all your little satellite churches that pay back to the mother church, you know. You're in a little mini Vatican there, Anderson. Mm-hmm. Hey, <laughs> I got to be saved because things are going good. I'm a good person. I got saved as a little child, <laughs> you know. And hey, anybody out there that's a supporter of Anderson, let me offer you a little challenge. Show me one video where Anderson talks about his life as a lost man that led him to the point of being broken, saying, I need Jesus to save me. Show me a video where he gives his testimony about how did he come to the point of conviction where he realized he was a sinner. Not going to happen. 
But we're going to do a fine little study here in the Scriptures. I'm going to show you what the Bible has to say about this whole issue back here. What about somebody that's prosperous? Well, let's look at uh, Luke chapter 16. We're going to look at two rich men in the Scriptures. Luke chapter 16. Verse 19 through 25. <clears throat> there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Yep. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Hmm. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he left up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Hmm. You mean to tell me that that rich man died without ever losing everything? He was a good man. I mean, after all, how could he have amassed all that wealth and been so prosperous if he wasn't a good man? You see? Life was good for him. He wasn't being punished in, in this world. He was getting away with things. Prosperous. Just like Esau. So you see a lost man looks at, they look at other lost men. And they say, well, you know, I'm no saint, but uh, hey, you know, I don't do what they do over there with the Vatican. I don't molest children. So, you know, I mean, they're prospering. I'm prospering. Hey, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. they'll look at guys in the Bible and they'll say, oh, well, you know, I might not be guilty of this or might not do that or whatever, but hey, you know, as, as long as I'm doing good, God's prospering me. When the Bible says Esau have I hated, well, it can't mean that God would actually hate Esau. I don't think so. Esau did pretty good, you know. I'm doing pretty good myself. Mm -hmm. And they look at some preacher that's actually saved and they say, oh, look at that guy. Struggling with money, struggling with his health. Uh, just distraught about the condition of the world and he's having a hard time and whatever else people attacking him. Uh, you know, obviously God's blessing's not on him. That other Christian couple over there, they can't have children. <laughs> we can pop them out like rabbits. You know, God's blessing is all over us. We have lots of money, plenty of money. I'm not being punished there. I'm getting away with it. Mm -hmm. Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, they just seem to get away with murder, don't they? It's because they're in this crowd right here. Self-righteous sinners. Every single one of them. But now let me show you the testimony of another very, very wealthy, very, very powerful man. Turn back to the book of Daniel. Back to the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 28 through 37. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? It's a good man. Much like Esau, Esau got away with a lot of stuff, a lot of money. You know what I mean? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, 
and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth for ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason return unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness return unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the kingdom of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Two different rich men. The one rich man died with his wealth, died with everything else, without ever being broken. The second one, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, think about the significance of that. The very first king, first man that headed the very first world government, Babylon, ancient Babylon, the very first new world order, the king of that, absolute total monarch, dictator, very, very, very powerful man. And God takes him and says, I'm going to make an example out of you, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to break you and turn you to, to an animal. You're going to be out there in the fields and people say, isn't that the king out there? Made a fool out of him. A total fool. And after a while, his mind comes back. And what's he do? Oh, get all, whoever is responsible for this. God, you are worthy. You're the one that abased my pride. Thank you, God. He honored the Lord. Anderson's not about to do a thing like that. No way. God breaks him down, busts him down like that. I don't think he can, quite frankly, because he's, you know, his hatred for the Jewish people and and all the false stuff that he teaches, Jesus burned in hell and Sodomites can't get saved and whatever else. Well, then why are you working with one Paul Wittenberger? But, you know, it works for Hollywood, but whatever. Uh, you know, all this other stuff. And I think Anderson's a Sodomite as well, but that's another issue. Um, a lot of people think that way. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, Anderson has all this false stuff, so I don't think he's ever going to come to a point where he's broken. But the whole point is, for him to say... Esau will be in heaven. God didn't hate Esau. He's denying what the scriptures say. Esau have I hated in Romans 9, 13. God hated Esau. Oh, but, but Esau did a lot of good things. Esau got a little, away with a lot of good stuff. And he was nice to his brother. He turned out to be a pretty good guy. You see? Two marks of a self-righteous, lost sinner. I should put lost up there. Self-righteous sinner. Every single one of them is that way. Anderson is a victim of childhood conversion, as I've said before. You can't be saved as a child. Plain and simple. You are not going to understand that, hey, I have sinned against a holy, righteous God. That's why a child that dies, they go to be with heaven. Or, excuse me, go to be with the Lord in heaven. Say it that way. They're automatically saved. They reach that age where they now are accountable to God because they understand you know, what sin is and who God is and everything else. Okay, now they're going to be held accountable. But a young child? My mommy led me to, to, to the Lord when I was two years old. You know, I got convicted of my sins because I you know, messed my diaper the one time and I didn't tell my mom about it. I didn't cry, so I realized that I lied and that's when I needed, knew that I needed to be saved or something. Warped. Just totally warped. So, watch out for this stuff. Okay? The biggest part of this study that I want you to come away with, watch out for Jesuitical sophistry. The Jesuits are the ones that mastered this whole thing, where they will say things like, the Bible says, Esau have I hated, but it doesn't mean that they will, they will say it forward, and then they will reverse it and say it backward, and make Two contradicting things to cause confusion. And you say, huh, what? Uh. You know, there's a lot of people that say that, that God hated Esau. But I don't believe that way. 
because it was actually the, the people of, East, uh, of, of there that God hated. It doesn't mean, it says Esau have I hated, but it doesn't mean that God hated Esau. See how they go forward? The Bible says Esau have I hated, but it doesn't mean that God hated Esau. You see, they'll, they'll do that. Forward and then backward. All right? I know that the Bible doesn't say that you have to be part of a local church, but that's, people come to that conclusion because they're not part of a New Testament local church. You see? They'll take the forward, they'll take their statement forward, and then they reverse it and take it backward. And once they do that, they've caused, caused confusion in your mind. Okay? You know, um, the, the Freemasons are not a secret society. We are a society of secrets. You think, huh? Reversing. Make a statement, and then you turn, and you take it right back so that you've just undid the thing. It's some kind of a weird little, you know, it's, it's sophistry is what you actually call that thing. I'm not just making that term up, but it is some kind of a bewitchment type of a spell is what it is. You know, um, we're going to fight the war on terror by bringing terror to the terrorists or something, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, whatever. We're going to, you know, fight your addiction to drugs by putting you on life-saving drugs. So, um, watch out for this guy. And, and again, we need to make as much noise as we can about Steven Anderson. Just come out and say, that guy is false. Because what they want to do is they want to make Steven Anderson the head of the Bible-believing movement. Um, he's, he's a King James only guy or whatever else. He's not King James only. He uses new versions. He, I shouldn't say uses new versions, but he'll change the King James Bible text. He's done it in many videos. I've proved it. You know, he's not a Bible-believing Christian. I mean, for crying out loud. So, just let's be vocal about Stephen Anderson, okay? Um, his, his little cult is going to come crashing down. You can tell there are so many skeletons in the closet. I mean, Donnie Romero messing around with prostitutes, drugs, gambling for years, and he doesn't get caught. You know, when he finally does get caught, he comes out reading this little prepared statement and, and right away Stephen Anderson comes in. I'm going to be appointing somebody over this church now. That, you know, well, can we have a say in the matter? No. Um, I, I'm here, you know, in this independent Baptist church to uh, tell you what to do. I thought it was the men of the church that make those decisions. No. See, the devil raised up the whole new IFB thing with Stephen Anderson and... He's one of Satan's favorite little minions out there, little minister of, of Satan. All right, uh, we have to stand against it and just, just let people know, hey, the, the new IFB, we're not part of that. Um, they aren't King James Bible believing. Okay, so uh, very important to get that across. Um, the Bible says God hated Esau. Don't let anybody talk you out of that. Just one final thought on this whole issue of did God hate Esau or was it his the people of Esau, the Edomites. Um, think about this for a minute. If Anderson is right that God didn't hate Esau and that God prospered Esau and that Esau's actually saved and in heaven, um, why would God curse his descendants? Isn't that kind of weird? Esau was a saved man. He was a good man. He believed, but God cursed his descendants. Why? <laughs> Think about that. I mean, you just go with the plain English of the King James Bible. It says God hated Esau. Um, that's all you really need to know. But even beyond that, if God didn't hate Esau and he just hated his descendants, the people of Esau, the Edomites, what justification would God have had just to hate them as a people? No, God hated Esau, the man, and his descendants were cursed as a result of that. So... Think about that, all right? Uh, the wrath of God is coming to the to Stephen Anderson and his household. He's false. You can only fake being a Christian for so long, Anderson. And uh, your time is coming. Your days are numbered, all right? Uh, if you're watching Stephen Anderson, get away from him. Um, lest the wrath of God fall upon your house as well.